like three minutes each. I will be controlling the time and giving the speaker uh, some uh, notes about the time. So I will be showing like one minute or two minutes between more four minutes or three. Okay, three, three, four minutes. But uh, I will show like two minutes left, one minute left. Please uh, keep your presentation short because we are a lot of uh, people wanting to say a lot of interesting things. But uh, in order to work, we have to be quickly. So uh, hopefully, all the presentations are already here. Yes. Okay, so the rules are, are those, like three, four minutes talks. Uh, there will be no questions, but don't worry because uh, we will have later an open space where you will be able to discuss uh, the topics with the people who have presented. The open space will be uh, um, a time we will be talking in small groups. Uh, the people who have presented the, the, these lightning talks and whoever wants to propose another topic will have a paper saying, okay, I want to speak about this. People will move. Uh, to the people who have presented these topics, and they will start uh, discussing about uh, uh, about the, their interest, the, about the topic the, that interests them. So uh, I don't know if you have any any questions. If not, we will start with the with the talk, uh, lean development for flows. One of the things that motivate uh, development in free and open source software projects is the uh, is, is scratching of <laughs> our niches. And that is a thing that we do extremely well, fulfilling our needs. Um, but and we create, we create uh, tools that are very good for our needs. For example, the command line. An uh, extremely efficient tool for uh, operating with the computer, uh, but it requires to learn it. And we think that all the people that use computers should learn this. And this is not true. It's like thinking that every people who owns a car uh, should be a, is an expert in, in mechanics. But people just uses the car to go from one point to another. And um, they don't, I, I, I aren't interested in doing uh, amazing things with their cars. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I think about focusing in, uh, in the community who is using this all um, And we think that putting more and more features in our software will do that people use it. 
and even uh, and uh, we are like frustrated because nobody uses the software and we are alone developing our tools uh, without a community. So enter Lean software development. Uh, it is based in Lean principles. Uh, it's this strong, there's a strong movement around uh, Lean startup and uh, it's based on uh, agile techniques but the main point is not developing your your uh, tool but asking people uh, do people need what I want to develop uh, doing interviews <coughs> and uh, researching uh, for what we, uh, are the needs of people. So the thing is that we investigate, we identify some needs, and we make an offer to fulfill those needs. So we have problem hypotheses, things we that you, our users may need, we don't know, we have to uh, make experiments to see if they are those needs and hypothesis are our, our solutions. If our solution is fulfilling the needs, an example, um, we have found that maybe participants in our uh, in communities need this need recognition for what they are doing. So we are we think that developing a thanks app may be a solution for it. And. Yeah. Five minutes. That's three. That's three minutes. So, took out of five. No. <laughs> so it's iterating. We have an hypothesis. We build something minimal, test it and experiment, and learn. And do it and do it and do it again. Very agile, very quick. And the thing is, get out of the building and go to the street, go to the users and ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's not five minutes, it's three. Uh, the next talk will be uh, with her. She's, she's, not, she's, not, she's not here. So I can do it. So it's your turn. In the coaster, we'll be presenting now. Yes. So hi. So I'm Pierre from Indie Hosters, and I'm really glad to be here among you. And like every people here, we are here to save the world, and our proxy to do that is by saving the web. And let's take a concrete use case. You want to put your files online, right? And today you do it by going to Dropbox, because you learned about it. And, uh, do you know what's a CTA? Please raise your hand if you know what's a CTA. No, so it's a three-letter acronym also, but <laughs> it's a call to action. It's a user experience. Uh, the, so it means it's for the purpose of your website. So if you have a blog, it could be signed up to my newsletter. If you have a product, it might be uh, buy my product. So what is the CTA on this web page? Sorry? Sign up. Exactly. So you have a sign up button. And as a user, you click there, you put your email, your password, and bam, you have your service. <laughs> it's really slick user experience. And yesterday you heard about Tristan saying that privacy does matter. And actually it's a huge threat to our democracy. And um, I have a friend that says that privacy is like uh, radioactivity. This microphone, for instance, might be radioactive. But today I don't care because, first of all, I don't know. And second, I don't feel anything. But in 20 years I would die from cancer. And privacy is the same. Today you might have nothing to hide, you should have something to hide. But today you might have nothing to hide, but tomorrow you go to another country and they have different rules and suddenly you regret your tweet about this prime minister. And now you're in jail. And so if you don't do it for yourself now, do it for your future self at least. So you heard about all these privacy issues and you want a free software. And this is great because for every proprietary software we have a free software alternative. 
And you heard about OnCloud, is a free software alternative to Dropbox, so you go there. So what is the CTA here, please? Learn <laughs> Sorry? Learn more. There's learn more, it's one of them, okay? And the yeah, second yeah. one, download. Who in this room knows what to do with the file that we get from this download button? Okay, one, two, okay, some of them, but it's a special room here with special people. I remember, I, re I recall you that you came to this website to have a service, not to spend hours on setting up a server that you forgot. <laughs> and so our idea with Indie Hosters is to replace this download button with a sign up button. And we want to ease the process of signing uh, to free software and using free software in the cloud. So if you are, if you are a user uh, and you want to get back your privacy, please get in touch with us, for you, your family, or your organization. And if you're a software developer, get in touch with us also. We would love to host your software. Thank you. So the next one is? The next one is Ed Striders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please for the space later. Thank you. Thank you very much. platform that started in 2012 as a Council of Europe pr uh, project to connect, uh, collect ideas of social economical transformation and then it was transformed into into our corp uh, social uh, corporate body uh, and it hosts uh, different projects for example Amonastery which is uh, which is a so co-living co-working project uh, which took place in uh, Matera in Italy last year, and it was part of the successful bid of uh, uh, Europe uh, Cultural Capital 2019. Um, it hosts also Lotte, um, it started Lotte Project, which is Living on the Edge gatherings, uh, which happen every year in different uh, cities in Europe, and, uh, and MakerFox, which is a platform that um, um, well, promotes a barter uh, exchange, and yeah, I think I will tell you a little bit more about it. Do we have a site? No, I don't know. They're not here, so. Oh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so um, MakerFox uses <coughs> uh, a, an academic library for solving linear programming <coughs> problems to provide a computationally efficient way of doing uh, not only circular barter but network barter. So. You wind up with this huge network of potential trades, and MakerFox will go around and identify the maximum uh, economic transfer that can be done as a kind of an eigenvalue loop, or an isovalue loop, not an eigenvalue. Loop. <coughs> so you could get, you know, 2,000 things which are in the system. It will identify 54 people that should swap. Some people will give away three items and receive five. And at the end of it, everybody is in exactly the same position that they were, but they've gotten rid of the stuff they didn't want and replaced it with the stuff they did. And we think that that's potentially a very useful utility that could be plugged into things like blockchains, it could be plugged into lending networks, it could be plugged into almost anything that's going to attach itself to physical property as a utility. So you take your data set, you shove it to MakerFox, MakerFox bashes it with their software, and then hands it back to you. Um, so potentially very useful for any kind of relocalization activity. Local currencies could include it as an alternative to eBay. It's a very useful thing. No? Yeah. Well, should, we do, should we talk a little bit about um, platforms and edge riders as a community? So the other thing is that you guys are looking very much for communities to partner with because we're really long on tech and we're short on communities. Edge riders has about 2,000 people <coughs> on a software platform, about 500 active, mostly localization uh, fanatics, lots and lots and lots of alternative politics, lots and lots and lots of alternative progressive policy. Um, because the entire thing runs on the internet and it's all about keeping people connected online and then organizing them into work parties to get stuff done, if you've got something that you need a kind of pan-European community partner for, come and talk to us and we can probably find you a subgroup inside that are interested in exactly that topic. I think we're getting cool. Thank you. Corporate 
conversation of peer-to-peer -peer commons. <coughs> no, it's not here. Creator, creation and development of wikis. Yes. I started uh, volunteering with Couchsurfing. Uh, at that time, the most active and uh, yeah, interesting hospitality exchange network. Uh, and my interest in that was to uh, make it open source. Uh, so I went there to a collective uh, in Montreal. And uh, the other one? Just green, that's fine. That's okay, that's great. Um, so um, it was very dynamic. We had like uh, we reached 100,000 members in that time, and it was uh, quite exciting. Uh, people were very uh, eager to help. Uh, I felt it was like the biggest opportunity, like in terms of well, at that point in time, for me personally, and also like to to change like my capacity to change the world, to work with this network and like extended to other things than hospitality exchange. Uh, after a couple of months, I noticed like, my attempts at making it open source, uh, like I was uh, supposedly a leader of the tech team, so I was attracting all these people that were coming from all the world to, to help out with this, with building this thing. Uh, we set up a Google code repository that started, okay, let's, let's put the code there. But I got a no from the guy who founded it, uh, Casey Fenton, uh, he was a good friend, I mean, we were hanging out, we were having a lot of fun, uh, these nice houses that were paid by uh, with uh, the money that was coming into Couchsurfing because people were getting verified, uh, which just means that you pay $25 and uh, you, with a credit card, a credit card, doesn't have to be your own credit card, uh, and you're verified, uh, so that, which is, doesn't mean so much. Um, so that was the monetization of, of the thing, but it was still non-profit in the United States. Um, if you know about non-profit law in the United States, it's not apparently that strict. Uh, there was talk of getting a 501c3 status, uh, which is like a, more like a charity. A charity would have been uh, much more protected in that sense. But so after a couple of months, I found out this open source wasn't going anywhere, so I left. The, the collective, I left the uh, people in. Uh, one of the battles in that process was the NDA, the Non-Disclosure Agreement, uh, because a lot of people joined and they saw the NDA and it was like, mm, no, I'm not gonna sign that, because the NDA was uh, just taking all your rights on anything you would do in that context. Like you couldn't release, even if you write something in that context or you create something in that context, uh, you were not allowed to release it yourself as uh, in another uh, way. Uh, even the, it also mentioned software patterns, uh, all these nasty things. Uh, so I, my my first objective was to change the NDA. Actually, um, I failed, uh, and I like when it was really clear that I failed. It was after I left the, the collective in, in New Zealand. Uh, that was in May 2007. I I I quit, and three other people quit me. Were with me the same day. Uh, fast forward four years later, Couchsurfing announced we need more money. They had two million dollars a year coming in from verification money, uh, and suddenly they need even more money. Like I don't know why. Like uh, it's it's uh, so they uh, sold out to venture capital. Uh, suddenly this non-profit is a for-profit C corporation. They call it. Uh, B corporation, but B corporation in the United States or anywhere in the world just means you go to another uh, company and you, s you give them some money and then you get uh, verified as a B corporation. So it doesn't mean anything, and like it does, it means like very little to me, and it's not 
any guarantee that uh, data not going to be sold or uh, yeah, all these things that we want. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I know we're at the point, like even four years later again, that cloud shipping started, uh, they don't know how to monetize, they burned through the $20 million they got from venture capital. Uh, they started putting ads on the website. Uh, they're experimenting with verification on a yearly basis, which makes even less sense. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very sad in a way, because I, th I think this network had a lot more potential. Um, but so the corporatization of the, of the comments, I think Couchfame was, and it still is kind of like a, a comments where people share their homes with other similar people but it's controlled by this entity that doesn't really function on, a, on an equal level. It doesn't really communicate with its constituents. Uh, you have like one minute for right. the next one. Okay. If you want to. Right. <laughs> oh, the next one. Yeah, just forgot the next one. I think this one is. Yeah, but then, then you did it a trick, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I think, I think it's, it's, very, it's very important that to, to know like who, like what are the, the thoughts, what are the, the legal things behind uh, uh, an organization uh, and to be aware of like what what you're joining when you even even when it seems a non-profit I mean, everything seems legit uh, can we fix this with the human uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope so <laughs> yeah so yeah um, I think that's that was a bit of my talk to talk a lot, a lot about this but Okay, so I will be doing a three minutes talk on um, Grow, a network to learn the knowledge and the growth, in including um, the idea of a community platform, commons based peer production process that we do in the development of education materials for degrowth, um, agile development, and uh, collective action. Um, so what is GROW? It's basically a, 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 a European uh, Grootfig Learning Partnership um, on adult education, constituted of nine partners of, uh, in, um, in uh, um, eight countries, and uh, with the aim of building an international networks of trainers and learners um, that helps to bridge theory of degrowth. Who knows what's degrowth? So the others can uh, we can <coughs> after one. Uh, so bridging this theory of degrowth with the multiple practices that it has, some of them not even uh, spoken as degrowth, but which uh, which come together, uh, building up open knowledge and materials, um, and uh, also uh, we have offline courses. Uh, why we need this? Well, we want to systematize and reproduce successful experiences, particularly from these so-called nautopias. Some use also the term heterotopias, but not of this more common under the growth literature. Um, to reduce the dependency from economic growth and capitalism. Um, to provide tools uh, to address the multidimensional crisis that we are facing, economic, social, um, um, human, human, and so on. Uh, and to promote convergence and support collective action, because we, we uh, see that the growth has been providing a very solid framework that has not been until now co-optated and uh, um, where many of the movements and initiatives that are working in the transformation, we can speak from commons uh, <coughs> to uh, urban gardening to um, DIY movements, so they identify themselves with the, with the theory, with the ideas and with the framework of degrowth. And uh, the pro uh, proof of it was that, um, is that the degrowth conference, for example, the last one international, had over 3,000 participants in Germany. So what we want to do, basically text, experience and related diversity of approaches, uh, content tools and methodologies for training on degrowth, uh, build a framework to promote a continuous learning process um, uh, across different levels, also exchange with uh, uh, research and, uh, and bring in critical questioning from the praxis into, into the theoretical level, and promote exchange, collaboration and co-production of degrowth knowledge commons. Uh, we use the idea of a, a community of practice as a uh, underlying concept on which we learn and on which we come together um, as as, uh, as the different communities. Um, we have a process, so this is basically a scheme of how the uh, 
grow network operate. So we have courses, we have the virtual community, we have a community building process between offline and online, and we have like a, a train the trainer. Uh, so we are training trainers to, to uh, on the network. So every learner is, is also theoretically becoming a trainer, taking part in the development of the <coughs> modules, and so on. And uh, this is the list of uh, the modules we are developing, the list of the courses that we have, and. Um, yeah, and this, uh, then we developed this, we use this platform and de uh, develop it partially, community.net, with very little resources. So basically, we, we, I call it a bootstrapping process, in the sense that we start, our bootstrapping starts by bringing together the communities, these communities of practice that we need to produce content. So we developed it uh, based on Drupal Open Atrium, uh, because it provided most of the features that we needed for a start, and we go on, on simplifying it and on adapting it to the different use cases of the different communities. Currently, we have degrowth communities, food sovereignty, community supported agriculture, transition towns, food co-ops, and there are permanently new communities uh, joining and wanting to use uh, 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 the tools in one another way. We use Agile co-production um, um, for uh, uh, Agile for the co-production of materials, so we run Scrum Sprints, and this helps us to deal with chronos and kairos and with closure <coughs> and openness of the teams. So at any moment in each sprint, we can build new teams that are starting to develop or continuing to develop certain modules. So, um, coming up, uh, Relays Network, um, as well, you, uh, some, a few interesting things that the growth portal is being built. There will be the next conference. Um, open questions, uh, um, should we focus on current communities or broadening, interoperability and federation, where and how, um, apply to CAPS or join a CAPS. So we had originally a proposal for applying for a CAPS, not with Grow itself, but also in coordination with a few other ideas. Uh, but maybe it's more interesting to join a CAPS. Uh, I myself can provide so also some uh, some of my experience and, and time in, in a, the, an application development. We need Drupal developers, designers, funding as usual. And if you are uh, interested or if you did not understand something or uh, if you just want to talk, um, here are different contexts from me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we will have uh, Drupal for community uh, currency. Good morning, my name is Matthew Slater. My Twitter handle is MattSlats, M-A-T-S-L-A-T-S. About uh, seven or eight years ago, I decided to build the software that would support the Let's movement and the Time Banks movement. And I identified <coughs> Drupal as a wonderful platform for that, because in Drupal, it's very easy to do the architecture and to take ownership of the site without writing code. So you have a, uh, a little experienced user and they can uh, set up content types and wire things together and choose the theme. And I thought that was a, a very good way to start giving the autonomy of the software to the users. So I developed a Drupal module called Community Accounting. And what that does is uh, keeps accounts between the users and gives them a payment form. And you could call this qualitative sorry, quantitative accounting, because it, it's, uh, it's supposed to mimic money. The idea is that any one unit in this quantitative accounting is the same as any other one unit. And when you give one, uh, the other user gets one and you lose one. So we need to contrast this with uh, qualitative accounting, which is what I think we're supposed to be talking about more here today, where you're recognizing, you're paying people points of, um, uh, recognizing that they've done good work and you don't lose it when you pay it. So that's a very different kind of accounting. But it's still value accounting, so that's why I'm here. So having done this in Drupal, having set up a non-profit organization called Community Forge, which is now hosting 130 Let's and Time Banks across Europe, <coughs> I've done that, I want to join them together with uh, uh, an open protocol. Uh, so we're putting in a CAPS proposal to do that. Uh, we're going to use Ripple, for those of you who know uh, some of the far out cryptocurrencies, because Ripple is the only cryptocurrency that I've seen that understands credit. All the other cryptocurrencies, as we talked about yesterday, are broken because they issue this, these units and they're all only positive value and you can't have a negative value in a wallet. So in Ripple you have the notion of uh, credit and debit uh, mirroring each other. 
Yesterday, I heard from uh, the New South Wales Time Banks, which is running my software, that they've been approached by a CAPS proposal from Italy, which wants to network together all the Time Banks. Well, that's almost exactly what I'm attempting to do. Um, so I'm trying to get in touch with them. I've written to them. And I said to the guy writing uh, our CAPS proposal, what should I say to them? Because the mechanism, the funding mechanism has put us in direct competition for what is surely the same funds. And he said to me, we should attempt to, first of all, get to know each other a little bit, and then write each other into each other's bids as major partners. So if the EU wants to fund something like joining all the time banks together, joining all the debts together, joining all the business barter systems together, then uh, the people who've expressed an interest in that bid can be working together on it in one capacity or another. So that's what I'd like to say to you. Write each other into each other's bids if you can see commonality. I don't know if you can second that. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, A year and a half ago, I had this idea of uh, making uh, ride sharing, real time ride sharing, and somehow eventually we get into the decentralized world. So I'll tell you very briefly about that. Um, but basically, it's a free, free transportation, and it's called Azul. So I don't need to tell you much about the problem of transportation, but I do need to tell you that this is actually the real problem of transportation, which is the average number of people in a car in LA, in uh, Russia. So this, this is really the problem of transportation. Um, basically, we are putting a lot of energy to, to shift empty spaces from place to place. That's mo most of what we do. So the solution, of course, you can build more infrastructure, as we everyone are doing, or you just can make better use of the existing infrastructure. And of course, that's the only solution which will actually solve anything. So use technology to better use the already existing resources. So this is going under the name of smart transportation, or smart transportation, and there are already a bunch of successful services under this name, all, all, all sort of services. However, none of them is really uh, tackling the major problem of commuters entering the cities. Uh, so still, it, it's still a minor movement. And the real thing that really will tackle the major thing is real time outrage. This is the holy grail of smart transportation, actually. And there are a lot of virtues for that. They give you the lowest rates. The, the um, multi-hop solution is, is a great virtue. Maximum efficiency. It also becomes social network eventually. And it's also the cheapest in terms of development. Highest market cap if you want to invest in that. But, and maybe that's the, <laughs> I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing, but it hasn't been established yet. And why, oh, oh sorry, why? So there are some trials over these directions. Uh, it hasn't been established because of critical mass problem. We need to generate critical mass of users before it's operated. Okay, let me just keep the, all, all the trials so far which are unsuccessful in that direction and our trial which is made, making the centralized community. Um, so this is the Azul Centralized Ride Sharing Network, blurring the boundary between founders, developers, investors, early adopters and users, encouraging participation, uh, rewarding any contribution for development or for early adapting in terms of tokens, the, the ZOOS tokens, uh, that are distributed to people who use the system before it's operational. Um, <coughs> let me skip that. Um, so we already have, um, how do I do that? I don't know. Is it for profit? It is a decentralized application. It's not for profit, it's not non for profit, it's a new business model. I can elaborate on that, I can tell you. Yeah. There is profit to people who contribute, 
the organization as a whole, there's no profit. Okay. I mean, legal entity is being. There is no legal entity. Okay. I can discuss that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, yeah, I wanted to show you actually the app. I'll show you in a minute the app and all that. But basically, uh, it's a, again, it's a, it's a new model of this new business model, decentralized organization. Anyone can contribute and receive tokens for that contribution uh, under some protocol. Uh, this is the website I'll show you. Let me just show you the. Um, yeah, so this is the website. Oh, why doesn't it work? Oh, it's another screen. Drag it. Yeah. With direction. Three fingers. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Oh, we are. So this is the human brain, a web of billions of neurons working together. Blah blah. And this is how the internet works perfectly with millions. And this is how transportation looks like. Uh, and this is the app that you can download uh, today and start driving and building net the network. While once there is enough uh, users in the network, ride sharing option will enable. And until then, no, no user are disappointed to open the app, try to ride share and see there are no user around. That's basically it. Very briefly. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Vouch safe. I would have said, I, I'm just going to give up on that because I can't say it in three minutes, I've decided. So uh, what I am going to say though is that um, there's been a, a lot of uh, um, disappointment. Oh my god, I've built something beautiful, why won't it blossom, blossom, why isn't it growing? Think about all of this as something like the Cambrian explosion, but without the restriction of only being able to evolve from a single point. The process of cross pollinization that those tables had yesterday produces not necessarily a concrete physical object in the world, but a story. And the stories we tell each other permeate forever. Okay? And the collective sort of experience of reality that we're creating, morphic resonance of the ideas that we have, is so immensely powerful that it will change the world in a way that none of us will experience because we'll be dead. But it will be beautiful for someone one day, which is why we are in, inspired for the future. So who cares if your perfect future doesn't occur in this <coughs> utopia? Let's just keep telling this story without any purpose other than the perfection of our aspirations. surveillance uh, in French. So uh, unless you start reading French, you'll be in trouble reading it. Um, and I want to talk to you today about uh, building post-Snowden cloud services. Of course, Snowden is Edward Snowden, which in June uh, 2013 uh, revealed the NSA and the GCHQ uh, uh, actions uh, against us and our data, us users and citizens of the world. And I, w I have been thinking about what would be a system uh, that is a, um, someone's phone ringing, all right. Uh, the NSA is calling, I'm sorry. Um, seven principles so that we build systems that are respectful of uh, users and their data. Uh, and these are these uh, seven principles. Uh, the first one is you need to run open source software. Makes sense? So that it's transparent, someone, if not you, 
yourself, but someone else can read the code and audit it and see if it does what it's supposed to, to be doing. Um, so it's a transparency uh, thing, and also because you can customize it, adapt it to your needs. Uh, the second principle is about hardware that we control, ideally something uh, that can run next to your DSL box and be physically hosted uh, at your place. Uh, cryptography is about encrypting pretty much everything, especially on the transport level, because we cannot trust the network because we actually know uh, it is being monitored by uh, a government organization with amazing budgets. Um, the fourth one is, is slightly different in nature in the sense that we need to get rid of the targeting, targeted advertising model because it is what pushes companies to spy on us. Um, and of course, makes it's very easy for government agencies to require uh, request this information to uh, these uh, large cloud services. But and and this is uh, this is something it's, which is worth uh, saying, especially in open source and free software environments. User experience does matter more than we even think, um, and so we need to build delightful products. Uh, and it's not easy because we tend to be for ourselves. Uh, it needs to be interoperable, and as you may remember, this is the, the request I made yesterday on this stage uh, to build, uh, to come and join us to build in part interoperable products, um, and also offer values that big silos cannot offer. One minute, all right. Um, enter uh, Cozy Cloud, which is um, uh, the, the, the company I have recently joined because it does mostly that, not all of it just yet. Um, I'm working on it, and the team <coughs> is working on it. Does calendaring, contacts, email, files, photos, and synchronization with uh, your uh, smartphone. All of this run uh, on your own server, and can it has this uh, killer app, which is matching up data between different sources on your own server. So bank accounts, bank statement, phone statements, address book, all of this, you can match it up. Uh, there never has been a better moment uh, for this movement uh, to work. So it's not just Cozy Cloud, it's also uh, the other open source um, uh, offerings that can succeed because it's the right moment. The hardware price has dropped. This can run on a Raspberry Pi 2, which is roughly, uh, I think, 30 or 35 pounds. Um, the software is making progress every day. And also, uh, pre-internet large organizations, such as <coughs> insurance companies, telcos, and such, are very, very concerned that they will be uh, killed by Google and the other organization, like, like Uber is killing the taxi business. Uh, they don't want to uh, feel the same effects on their business. Cloud or stories are popping up everywhere, like you may remember the yes celeb gate, people taking photos with their iPhones, and they end up online, they don't understand why. <laughs> and we also generate a lot more data that is very personal. So my call to action is join us. Uh, visit our website, cozy.io. Uh, we are ready to offer you a free instance so that you, you can try, provided that you become a beta tester. Um, or you can install your own version at home on your own server if you're technical enough. The forum is open. Uh, I am here until 3 p.m today uh, with my colleague Paul, uh, so come and talk to us. Uh, there are tons of things we need to be doing in order to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Mailstorm browser. Yes, I will be there. Okay. No, but this is the file chat one. So the remaining speakers, please be really short with your presentations because we still have a lot and we are uh, after schedule already.
Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I will make, Nick asked uh, people to tell stories, and I will tell you a story which hopefully will inspire you. It's about the weaved structure. It's a structure to construct something which can find or, or combine the, the knowledge of a group of people. So it is a structure for uh, collaboration. Next. What is the problem? The problem is hierarchies. You, you notice the boss is the boss of Mr. Dil Dilbert. Uh, it, it worked fine, hierarchies, and everybody is accustomed to have a hierarchy. And I don't know why, because it do doesn't function right. It cannot cope with co uh, complexity. It cannot cope with sudden changes. It has silos. People are infighting all the time. Even if you want to have several projects like here combined, people fight each other for budgets and it just doesn't work anymore. Too many levels and it is uh, a, a disaster. Um, and it is always a command and control structure. Well, who invented it? Napoleon, for God's sake. Because if you have a large army, you cannot talk to all the soldiers down there and tell them what's going on in the bigger uh, view, you have no way of communicating well. And, and in large companies, they only tell good news up, up, uh, up in the organization. And the, the, the people downward in the organization have to do what's, what, what they are told. And it doesn't help to get people involved. So it's out of touch with reality. It doesn't, it doesn't function anymore. So do we have an alternative? Can we just send all the managers to be retired? Maybe that's the solution. Because they add nothing. They're just fighting and talking about money and have no idea what's going on, on in the workforce. Well, maybe the, we should. There are some examples in the Netherlands where people f uh, have, uh, yeah, OK. Um, now we have billions of people connected with m smartphones, with internet. So I w nobody should be surprised that there is a, uh, something going on which, which gathers this uh, collective intelligence. And uh, well, I have an idea how to, to fill the gap between the in millions of interactions and emergent behavior. Yeah? And this is this graph rather stunning, but it is in fact developed what in mathematics. Yeah? You, you know this? This is a fast Fourier transform, which is built into video. It's built in our brains. We have to interconnect people from very wide sources. Every person has two inputs and two outputs, so it's a simplification. Yeah, it's not reality. You, you should build it much more. It's resilient. Nobody can destroy this, and it is uh, the next one, please, and then I'm finished. Yeah, this one. Is, it is like a lens. Every point here is connected to every point there, and it, only a few steps you have connected the whole world, and it can scale. It can scale up to billions of people. <coughs> the nice thing is that it, there is correlation going on here. You can match things. You can match things which you have remembered. And you, it works in the brain. It works in colonies of bacteria. Nature has already done this on a large scale, and we haven't <coughs> found that yet. It's in a swarm of birds. It's emergent behavior. And uh, well, it's not that hard to do. Most of the projects I heard have already things which are near this, and then, well, we have to build not the state, not the business, but the civil society. We have to build up that. And that's the third corner of the trias internetica. It's not the trias uh, uh, from Montesquieu. Uh, this is a new one, and you can read it later. 
it's on the user side. It's not as on the it's on the demand side. They are getting organized, and you can read this article in the Harvard Business Review. Last thing is fire chat. The Chinese students in Hong Kong, yeah, they used fire chat with their smartphones to build a map, <coughs> which builds automatically without any. Uh, uh, mobile network without any internet and the, the government tried to turn it down and they had the, the network with them yeah? last one is you can read about Traveler, about Firechat, about Maelstrom Maelstrom is going to be very big but you can le read it later and I have started the Syntacracy movement and I hope you will join I'm only the first one to be member, so please join in. <laughs> Thank you very much. IPFS, yes. We will listen to IPFS now. Okay. Yeah, that's why they thought I was going to talk about it. Is that you? No. So, no IPFS on the floor? <coughs> Peer-to-peer -peer quantify it itself? No? Koina? <coughs> That's okay. me? Yes. So keep it for the space. Alright. Can you all see this? I was asked yesterday to do that. Um, of course, I also had a digital presentation, but uh, I decided to do it that way today. Because I just came from Lapland where we tested that and um, it worked pretty well. So, um, yes. My name is Daniel. I'm the CEO and founder of Koina. Koina is the Greek word for common or commons. And, uh, keep going. All right, thank you so much. Can you switch that out? But only two minutes. All right, that's good. So, um, we all agree that there's something wrong with our monetary system. And uh, it was mentioned that uh, cryptos haven't really solved um, any monetary problem yet, or so far. So that's why we come, came up with Coiner. And Coiner basically um, is this. Does anybody in the room know uh, about um, Feilun, the Chinese ancient monetary system, which has been there for a couple of thousand years? where China has built an empire on? No, that's awesome. No. Well, basically, they had these booklets, and it was a bilateral contract between um, two traders. So they said um, in a booklet like this, where they noted what they are delivering, for example, I'm delivering something to you, so I, you would owe me money, but there was never any money flowing, because the next day I would come to you and sell my products to you, and then it is erased. And if we wouldn't agree on a price, uh, we would both get arrested. So that's how it was in China at the ancient times. In, in, wow. Yeah, that's true. Nothing has changed, really. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in rural areas in uh, Asia, they still do that. It's known um, as 555 bookets. Um, so, but this is a bilateral <coughs> system, and our monetary system is also a bilateral system between the bankers and the borrower, where the bank issues money to the credit to the borrower. Um, so the borrower is always in debt of the bank. And we want to have a non-debt-based system, um, just like uh, Feilun, which uh, we want to leverage uh, to the modern economy, to the crowd economy. So basically what we did is, um, instead of a bilateral contract, we are using a unilateral contract, which means that somebody who is producing value can monetize that value that he or the producer is producing to the economy or to the community um, by self-issued credit. That means... If you're a producer, let's say a baker, and you want to produce, let's say, cookies, to make it simple, 1,000 cookies to the community, which you are promising to deliver within the 31st of March this month, so a couple of more days. <coughs> And you would say, well, I would sell these for one coiner, let's say. One coiner, one coiner equals one euro or one pound, just to give you a little um, calculation help. So that would be then one coiner. 
then you would be able to issue yourself, in this case, 1,000 pointer up front. Um, now we also are implementing a rating tool, but everybody starts with 100%. And if you don't pay back then the self-issued credit that you spend into circulation, so that means you can pay within the network um, your products and services that you need for production, and when the money flows back to you, as you get it back when you sell these products, your contract is fulfilled. So it's basically a contract from one to all, which is also called a social contract. <coughs> but from the producer side, it's called unilateral contract. From the community side, it's called social contract. And so then, when the money flows back, because people buy the cookies, um, you get the money back in, and then it is deleted automatically by the system. That's why we call that smart money. And we are basing that on smart contracts based on a <coughs> Ricardian contract. And we have Ian here who invented the Ricardian contract quite some years ago. So our system is a smart contract, Ricardian contract based cloud, uh, contract cloud system uh, based on international law. And everybody from all around the world can just sign up with their private keys and join in. And this is what we do with Coiner. Thank you very much. So smart economy is, done, is run by smart contracts with a smart currency. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, one last word. If everybody would have a booklet like that, yes. and if we're going to digitalize that um, on your phones, then this is basically it. And that's what we're working on, digitalization of these booklets. Uh, I wanted to introduce Ian Gray. Uh, how many of you know what a Ricardian contract is? Yeah, a few? Ricardian. So Ian is the guy that invented the Ricardian contract, and I bought his gold backed anonymous digital cash in 2000. So he's been doing this kind of financial cryptography stuff since the beginning of time. Ian, tell us what you're up to. Okay, uh, yeah. Well, you've got about a minute. Uh, a minute, right. Well, my name is Ian Gray. Um, I've been doing these cryptocurrency things. Uh, in May, it'll be 20 years. Uh, along the way, I invented the Ricardian contract, which could be seen as a, a way in which the legal world is going to change the world of cryptocurrencies as we know today. Uh, another thing that I invented or discovered with two others is what we call triple entry accounting, which could be seen as a way that um, the cryptocurrencies are going to change the world of accounting as we know it. Um, I've spent uh, a couple of years in Kenya where I've been putting currency technology into uh, financial inclusion and out of that um, a lot of developments have come out but probably the big takeaway is that we now know how to solve the identity problem and we now know how to solve the resilience problem for financial systems um, but I guess I'll be done my minute. Thank you. Distributed Academy. is um, how you could take a large institution and combine it with a radical, distributed, federated, decentralized architecture. Uh, in, other words, in order to get enough users and enough uh, motivation for the users to engage in it. And then, um, my interest long term is in cryptocurrency. In fact, I worked with Ian Grigg back in 2003, wherever he is. And before that, was liquid democracy. Um, working Place voting in 99 and what have you. So, very interested in law governance and how you can use uh, uh, soft and hard tools to create distributed organizations. So, how can we take a big institution? And I'm going to give you the example of one of our uh, project partners, the main project partners, which is a very traditional organization, which is the British Library. The British Library have started to release uh, Creative Commons based learning packs. So, how can a big centralized organization work? distributed organization. So how can you take an institution like a library or a university and distribute it legally, technically, physically, um, and uh, people-based? So 
So if you think of a university, what you have is room. So what if we distribute the spaces? So we're collecting um, a set of what we call real spaces, temporary spaces and physical spaces, based largely in Europe on the, um, the, the Fab Lab network um, with uh, the Fab Jam um, um, uh, 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 annual um, uh, celebration of uh, fabrication spaces. Uh, hacker spaces based on Global Game Jam, which is a network, and based on institutional partners called uh, Mozilla Foundation and youth hostels uh, for pop-up learning um, um, spaces. Technically, um, that's the, the, the hardware. We call that hardware. So uh, the, an actual physical space, which would have a hyper-local server running peer-to-peer -peer services. Uh, there are some of the services that we've indicated here. And specifically, we're interested in using small federated wiki which allows all the Creative Commons content that comes from the institutional educational partners for everyone to have their own personal federated space and drag and drop content from one space to another. We're building into that community currencies and the federated servers are linked by the blockchain. The blockchain does what we call social augmented system administration. In other words, it does things like authenticate the plugins that the, the peer-to-peer um, uh, applications use so that you can have multi-sig uh, and automatic install of small HTML5 JavaScript based plugins. It's all based on linked data. Um, we can show you a technical demo of it afterwards. So it's basically a federated, also we use the blockchain for the governance of the network. So all, if, when people join, they legally join uh, an institution which they can govern, they can administer and they can profit from. And they can profit from it it's a not-for-profit organization um, that uh, uses an inbuilt, two inbuilt community currencies or any other community currencies that people want to add. The first one is a time-based donation, so teachers can donate time, uh, institutions can donate time. It's built on, a, IPFS was mi missed here because one of the foundation technologies is a distributed uh, uh, YouTube. So uh, a large part of the embedding in the small federated wiki is small video clips so that you can film your own uh, lectures and your own talks. You can take the material from the institutional partners and then you can, in small study circles, uh, uh, film each other and present it as a community TV educational channel. So it's federated, it's based on federated technology, it takes large institutions, it's a legal entity in which the uh, information is created, commonly licensed, and the automatic attribution comes across as you drag pages from one person to another one person. But everyone has their own private, portable link profile and space. I think that's about it. It's a mouthful. But uh, you can look at it under distributed.academy or federated.academy or decentralized.academy because it's all the same thing in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have now linked data. Systems in 2000, where I researched the semantic web. <coughs> and uh, this is kind of the result of this research at the time. I've been working, uh, been working for free for the last year. Um, so let's start by the link to Open Data Cloud. This is a huge project um, that started with Tim Berners Lee in 1994. So the initial specs came out in 2001. And then it took some time before people realized they can link up all the databases. Um, you can get all the information there. These are just some of the databases that are out there. There's um, uh, libraries, the French libraries putting their data up. I, d I don't really follow it, it's just moving too fast for me. But the idea is that you can create distributed so, uh, distributed database which is linked between between cooperating, let's say, uh, organizations. It's a bit like you can create web of web pages with linked uh, data. You can create uh, links of relations. So you can have, you can imagine here a very simple three different types of organization, corporations, universities, 
associations, individuals too, I should add that there. And they can, uh, uh, you can imagine them having different types of um, uh, information. <coughs> like each organization has actors, uh, agents of some sort, um, people, robots. And they can have, each one probably has resources and projects that they need to work on. And these can link together as people discover that there's projects in other organizations and resources in other organizations that could work together with theirs. So they just need to link these together. And then you can imagine clients that go and fetch this information, JavaScript clients, whatever, fetch this information, follow links around, merge the information, and create some kind of uh, user interface. So a user interface like this. Um, and this is the um, this is a quick demo because uh, uh, here I, we have a so I'm working um, for free for Apache so we deliver Apache implementation using a, a Scala and a library from um, uh, the W3C called Banana RDF. Get the more information here on the Read Write website. I just started the server there. It saves all the files on the hard drive, so it's like Apache web server. I'm just going to see one resource there called Card. And it, it opens there a file. The JavaScript is fetching on the web all these different linked data that go from there, following uh, networks of friends. And all of these profiles are not on my server there. There's only about 10 relations on, on the server locally. All of this other information is out there on the web. And uh, as you saw on the linked open data cloud, the phone, the friend of a friend, global distributed graph is already pretty big. Here it's taking on someone else. And uh, these are some of the other pieces of uh, information. We also have buttons. So this is another thing. The edit button, that's uh, um, W3C has just finished uh, standardizing the uh, linked data platform, which is another, uh, which is just how do you read, how do you write, how do you create resources, how do you patch resources. This is now, and, and so now we can use that. So if you found a document which you didn't have right access to, you could, for example, edit something save it, and it, it would know wherever this thing was on the web how to uh, edit that piece of resource, right? So you can put up on this system, you can put up images, pictures, create uh, containers, add data, all of that is built in. Um, very nice, good. So that's the nice, um, how, so we, we can think of this in structures and layers. At the bottom we have the hardware layer, uh, you know, Freedom Box, massive servers if you're banks, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we work with all of those. Um, at the other level, we have the Read Write Web, which is HTTP, linked data pl platform, Web ID authentication. I don't have time to do that. Web access control, so you don't have firewalls around your your company. You can have every single resource have its different access control rules. The layer three is the linked data layer, which is this this interconnected layer between all these organizations. And then you have the web apps that use all uh, use this data here with web access control to read or write. And at the top layer, you have the social uh, layer, which is how all these organizations, the problems that people have in the world, and how they want to interact. And most of them don't need to know about these other layers, except that because we have these layers, they can interact a lot more smoothly than they could beforehand. Uh, so just a little quickly, technic technically, you can put public keys in your profile. You can have relations to protected resources. So you, know, you can see how this could go with the cryptocurrencies. Um, and uh, you can see how quickly the, each resource has an HTTP header, a link to an ACL. Members of uh, this gives access to everybody to this resource. This says there's a protected resource which has an ACL, which is here. And this says uh, this can be read by members of this group, which is on another server. So I can specify that as if, if this group here created a folk group of all the members here, I could say every member in this group and all your friends or something like that, can uh, read and write in some container of mine. Uh, we can edit a wiki or something like that. And you could, uh, you could, you could, and that could be flexible because you could change your friends. And as that happens, we would have different uh, different people would get access. So more information right there. And of course, uh, if you want, you can go to all the specs on the linked data protocol. There's Fujitsu, IBM, Oracle, <coughs> Apache, a whole bunch of universities that are uh, uh, participating in there. So this is a very, a very big movement, and I've noticed that there's not enough spoken about it here. And I know this is a research uh, thing about researching social networks. So this has to be really a core focus in your report. How come, you know, how can you use linked data to get the problem that um, Tristan was speaking about to get rid of Snowden problems? Right, we have all the technology. We just need to de uh, deploy it. We just need to learn how to use it, fix the bugs, and 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 the nice thing here is it's standard. So. 
W3C standards, no patents, no encumbrance. Um, anybody of you can implement this, and we can all work together um, uh, for, for this social web with different application stacks. So that's, um, that's it for now. Thank you. Now we have the last uh, talk. Uh, is we serve labs. Thank you very much. community of basically people who are interested in collaboration. Do you have a microphone? <laughs> I have a microphone, but when it's not sitting, this one is is a global community of people who have a shared interest in, uh, in the collaborative change. I think that's the best, best way to, to describe it. Uh, because we share as a community doesn't do one project as a whole. That the members and connectors we share are working on many, many, many projects. Uh, everybody on their own, sometimes together with different teams. And the Wisher Labs uh, is the tech part of it. So focus on, on software and uh, <coughs> Basically, what we do together, all of us, is using tools, a lot of them, like 30 to 60 or just a random number of digital tools, most of them proprietary software because we need to work, uh, it's usability over ideology and, and we just use something that we can use. And uh, that's what Henry's project is is going to incorporate one part of it is probably the analysis of visual tools and how we use it. But uh, what I'm interested in the labs, to do with the labs and with the help of visual communities to find out how we can use um, the knowledge and the user feedback from the community, from the end users, and bring it back to the software developers in open source to help them make the, their apps better also how to uh, how to facilitate uh, or like boost the open source software projects uh, maybe with marketing maybe with uh, boot camps maybe with shared resources for like ux advice or, or something like that to really to go to the projects identify the needs and and find how we can pitch in with the wisher community with the with the knowledge we have and um, Yeah. Basically, it's that. And okay. for that, we're going to have a Visual Labs camp in Paris on uh, 18 and 19 of May, just before the Visual Fest. Which will so, um, who's going to come? Stand up. <laughs> a lot of people with a project already, um, like participating, certainly. And. Um, also, also an open question is how to how to bring more open source software to users, and I think what what is the one thing that you all can do today to support it? Use Firefox. <laughs> Thank you very much to 
Thank you very much to all the speakers. It has been really interesting. Now we have a, a small space so people can uh, propose new topics for the open space. So please, if you have any idea you want to talk with other people, come here and in 20, 30 seconds explain uh, to them what you can talk about. Thanks. So uh, I'd like to take a quick crack at identity. Um, so we talked a lot about currency and specifically uh, key pair management as it relates to identity and what are our alternatives to key pair management. Thank you. So you, you, can, you can now write it down so later people can find you. Anybody else? Somebody else? Yes. For the open space, topics for the open space. And the lighting talks are going all in the open space. Yes. Yes, all the lighting uh, talks will have their own space in the open space. Um, um, I wish uh, to see how can we coordinate to not be computer um, according to the calls because we are all here uh, wanting to have the same money and I'm wondering how can we help each other to get instead of uh, competing together. Uh, it's uh, together to reply to the course. I agree. I will remember that. Uh, yeah, like, in the, in the, in the yeah, somebody else?
and uh, open uh, open source software education and public administrator administration. Sorry, um, we're contributors to the Commons Fest and to the uh, Foscom uh, uh, in Greece. Uh, our, uh, our latest uh, project concerning open hardware is um, uh, a contest that we have issued about uh, designing open hardware lamp posts uh, that um, gather data from the city and uh, collect this data on an uh, open platform and uh, provide the data free for everybody to use and build the applications uh, for the for the citizens. Do that with CCTV. <laughs> it has been done already. By sure. So um, uh, yeah, we have uh, we are also developing uh, software, open source software. Some of it is the CC radio to um, uh, uh, an online Creative Commons music radio, to the Scriptum application the platform, which is a which is a digital protocol management for public administration, the org chart, which is an organization chart management, and uh, documents management system. Uh, Website template for public administration uh, and the open government uh, consultation, a public consultation platform for um, uh, public administration. Yes, and that's it. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, before you, you start uh, summing up, we are now going to have an open space. So, please, the people who have uh, spoken before and the people who have uh, uh, ask uh, to have uh, a topic on this open space. Uh, you will raise your uh, piece of paper uh, with the topic you are talking about, and we will form uh, chairs, uh, groups, so people can sit and, and talk. The rules uh, of this open space are uh, that uh, you can move, you can you can go wherever you want, and that uh, every people is the right people to be in any conversation. Uh, I it, it might happen that you have a topic, no one comes to you, it's fine, it's not, a, I mean, maybe this was not the right audience for, uh, for this topic, it, it's not a big deal, but just, you can join other group, I mean, and like another participant. Huh? And so it's okay, now, if you have a new idea and you just want to shout out, hey, yes, right, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I mean, and, and if you feel that you are not contributing or you are not learning in a conversation, just move to another topic. It's it's odd. I mean, I mean the the layout of the of the chairs will change now, so we can. I mean, just feel free, feel free to to use the space as you like, being standing or putting the chairs in groups or however you want.